and we know that Arthur Smart, Arthur Smith, sorry, <laughs> Arthur Smith. Nope, is that's going his new <laughs> evil twin Arthur name. Snot. When we don't like him, he's Arthur. Oh, it's snot or Smot? I think I, you know, I like to talk about how Arthur Smith likes to run the snot out of the ball. I think I've Arthur said that about snot. a dozen times. So it just came out Done. Arthur Snot. Done. Arthur this, Snot. This is why people need to watch and subscribe because of this fun hilarity and <laughs> this comedy right is here. Quality content right here. <laughs> Arthur Snot is going to run the Smith out of the ball this week. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> Way to finish the play, Dave. Way to finish it. You've got to get these players into your starting lineup for week four. We are back with another episode for our week four starts of the week. I'm Alfredo Brown, Dave Kluge. We are joined by Jeff Hasley, one of the staff members over here at Football Guys. You can check out all of his weekly overview articles over at footballguys.com. Gentlemen, let's get started with our week four starts of the week. And we're going to start with everybody's favorite position. It's it's very much maligned, the running back position this year. Uh, Dave, we're going to start with you. Because I think you got someone that's a little spicy. Shocker. Shocker. Dave's going to create <laughs> waves here in the comments section. Let's see who you got. Yeah, you're setting me up for failure right at the start I of the show am. here. Always am. No, I get it. Like, we were just talking earlier in the week, and you were talking about potentially cutting Najee Harris from your team when we were talking about our cut show on Tuesday with Victoria Geary. And I've had a lot of people on Twitter asking me, should I cut Najee Harris? I think you got to give him one more week. And this is a week that I'm actually okay starting Najee Harris. Now, obviously, you're not, you know, starting him over your studs in your lineup. I'm not saying he's a top 10 smash. He fits in as my RB27. So if you're deep in the trenches, you know, zero RB build, you traded for Najee Harris, whatever it may be, I like him in this matchup against Houston. He's seen his attempts and rushing yards go up every single game, including 19 carries last week. And he has had, this is crazy because everybody talks about the inefficiencies of Najee Harris. This blows my mind. He has had a higher percentage of his runs go for 15 plus yards than any running back who has seen 25 or more carries. So we just keep hearing about how bad Najee Harris is. And I think the problem is that his offensive line and his offensive scheme are the problem here. But Najee Harris really hasn't been all that bad this year. Houston gave up a league-high 28.5 points to fantasy running backs so far this year, and they're on pace to do pretty similar to what they did last year with 26.2. So, again, the issue has been the offensive scheme and the offensive line. Those aren't just going to magically repair themselves overnight, but the Steelers, you know, I think that they can get back on track against Houston, who hasn't really been the defensive gauntlet that we hope for. Yeah, I mean, I I think we can see it this week. So again, I'm not beating the drum for Najee Harris tremendously, saying he's a top 10 smash or anything like that, but a few guys that I have him ahead of, Isaiah Pacheco, Jerome Ford, Rashad White, Damian Pierce. If you're looking for an RB2 or a flex play, I don't hate Najee Harris in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, it is a solid matchup against Houston, and uh, let's not get it twisted. I don't necessarily believe I was recommending that people cut Najee Harris from the right, roster. Right, just saying... saying- Right. It's one of those guys that's on the bubble. Like you were thinking about it because of the, the little production he's had. But Dave, you're you're 100 percent right. Najee has been better than we think. Some of those underlying metrics do point to a guy. I mean, he in in many aspects, he's been a better runner than Jalen Warren, the guy who gets all of the yeah. press clippings. Uh, Jeff, I'd love to hear your thoughts here on Najee Harris. I know he's not your start of the week, but I definitely want to hear what you think about Najee going up against Houston. Well, I do want to say that of uh, a lot of people who are watching and uh, listening, they have Najee Harris in their lineup, whether they like it or not. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so this is a kind of a, a breath of fresh air to hear that, hey, maybe there's a possibility. After week 10 last year, when the Steelers won seven of their last nine games to finish the season, Najee Harris was the uh, running back eight, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, he has the ability, he's got the talent. I, it, it's just that the Steelers offense is just kind of stagnant. It's just not happening right now. And, and it's week three, we've had three weeks and, and now we're going into week four, you know, it's the first quarter of the season. Yeah. It's not as good as what you would expect, but Hey, the Steelers are also two and one somehow. Um, but, but Najee is, I don't, I don't think it's him, even though I've seen some clips of him. It's like, whoa, where are you running? Why are you running into your, why aren't you following your blockers? You know, that kind of thing. But I do think that there is some sort of light at the end of the tunnel there for Najee. Najee, how are you saying it? I, I say Najee. I've heard it both right. ways. Anyway, um, and then there's the whole Jalen Warren 
uh, situation, you know, where Warren is coming in to gather some, you know, carry shares as well. And, and that's kind of keeping people a little bit unsure. There's a lot of uncertainty there. There's not much clarity in the Steelers backfield because they're both getting kind of equal, if like maybe, maybe 60 to four, actually maybe like 55 to 45 carries or so in terms of percentages. But yeah, it's possible, man. I'll be pulling for Harris because I have him in a couple of leagues. And like, you know, some of these teams are like one and two, oh, and three. And they're like, oh, come on, man. I, I have to start Harris. He's better do something for me. So I'm sure there's a lot of people who are listening to that, hoping that maybe he can kind of open up his can of whoop ass against Houston this week. Sorry, hashtag. Joe. Sorry, Joe. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, and, and the one other thing I want to say, first of all, I mean, I, the reason I mentioned Najee Harris is because he's averaging 5.7 points per game, which he invested a third round pick in this guy. You're not feeling too good about that. But you talked about last year, kind of on the back half of the season where Najee Harris was putting up good fantasy points and looked like himself. I think people forget that he played the beginning of the season with a metal plate in his shoe as he was dealing with a foot injury. And then his splits, once that plate came out of his shoe, he was a completely different player. You know, almost 17 carries per game, 68 rushing yards per game. He was averaging 14.3 fantasy points per game over the back half of the season. So, But that plate's not there now. this year. It's not there this year, and there have been some struggles with the offensive line and things like that, but I think we can look at the two years of previous production as a stronger indicator of what Najee Harris is more than just the last three weeks. This is just kind of my reminder. He's been a good football player for two years. He's accumulated a ton of fantasy points. Don't yank him out of your lineup just yet. He's playing Houston this week. Houston's a get-right game for just about every running back over the last two or three years. Start Najee Harris. We'd hope. We'd hope. So for, for <laughs> Najee, for Najee here, Dave, if he does have himself, a, let's say a solid game, right? 15 fantasy points, something like that falls into the end zone. Is he a sell high for you? Is he a buy medium for fantasy managers? What are, what are we calling him after this week? If he, if he plays well. I think you just hold him at this point because you're not going to get anywhere near the third round draft capital that you invested in him when you drafted him. You're going to be selling low at any point in time. Fantasy managers just don't like Najee Harris. Like we've heard for years that he's inefficient, that he's a plotter, that he's the next Trent Richardson. Like there's a vendetta out there against Najee Harris. Just hold on to him. He's going to be much more valuable in your lineup than he will be on the trade market. Okay, seven minutes of Najee Harris. Far too much <laughs> Najee Harris to start the podcast. A lot of people have already logged off. Jeff, let's go to your running back start of the week where you and I actually share the same player. So let's talk to the people about why Alvin Kamara is a must start going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, the Saints kind of have a running back problem right now. And Kamara is their saving grace to come back and, and kind of be that guy who can fill that void. Jamal Williams is out with the hamstring injury. Kendra Miller's a rookie. He's kind of uh, not necessarily struggled, but he hasn't really gotten the volume. He also is dealing with injuries himself. But, I mean, Kamara is Mr. Versatility. And I, I don't necessarily love the matchup this week against Tampa Bay, even though it's, it's a home game for New Orleans and it's his debut. The, the, the crowd's going to be ha happening. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Tampa's tough to run on. I mean, you, you, you pass on Tampa. You don't necessarily run. So... Um, although they did give up, what is it? 130 yards you know, to uh, DeAndre Swift last yeah, week. I was, so was going to say Tampa actually hasn't been as scary as years past. They're allowing about five yards per carry on the ground. So, I mean, you are right though. It is a, still a very good run defense. I think they've only allowed one rushing touchdown all season. So they looked uh, good against I, the run in week one. Cause they played the bears. Let's just call it like it is. <laughs> <laughs> was it was it the Bears in week one or was it week or two? Sorry, I thought was it was week, week two. Week yeah, two they played. They, they played Bears Alex. They, they played they Alexander Madison. Them. Yeah, yeah. Alexander Madison in week one, and then the Bears in he week was still, two. Yeah, he was still a top sixteen running back too because mm -hmm. of that receiving games. So Jeff, I think that's what you're alluding to here with Kamara. Yeah, that's right. And if Jameis Winston can kind of be the uh, the one who checks down to Kamara, I think we're looking at a double digit game and it, and it could be, you know, mid teens, upper teens in terms of fantasy points for Kamara. And I think that's what people are looking for. And that's what people are, are needing, especially if they have Kamara, they've been waiting for him to play. And then finally they can insert into their lineup. Who knows? Maybe they had Maybe they have uh, Najee Harris in their lineup that they had to play. <laughs> I would play Alvin Kamara over Najee Harris. Uh, and absolutely. Just make that clear. That's, what, that's what they're looking for, right? So, uh, you know, Kamara never had less than a, a top 20 fantasy season ever. So, I mean, he's there. He is going to be there, the, the guy that they rely on and turn to. And 
Uh, I think that week one being at home or week one, week three, his week one, his week, week one. four, excuse me, <laughs> edit that one uh, of those weeks, week, week four now entering and his, of course, his first game. I think it's going to be a, a, a time where, you know, the Saints kind of lean on him and he'll be looking forward to it, I'm sure. Yeah, we've actually seen uh, both Alexander Madison and DeAndre Swift finish as top 16 running backs against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And then we kind of saw like a worst case scenario where two running backs are splitting, where both Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson finished as top 36 running backs, RB3s. So if you're looking at a guy like Alvin Kamara, I think it's reasonable to assume Alvin Kamara is going to get the lion's share of the of the touches out of that backfield. Kendrick Miller might still get a few touches. Maybe Tony Jones gets a carry here and there. He's been making me look foolish the past couple of weeks. But Taysom my, Hill my, goal line. Stop it, Dave. Don't put that evil out into the universe, man. Enough with the Taysom Hill. I'm Taysom Hill will score show. when you don't want him to, and when you do want him to, he will uh, not score. So yeah, there you go. There's that. That's keep, Taysom keep Hill. Keep 26 points on your bench and two points in your starting <laughs> lineup. That is the Taysom Hill experience. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks, pal. Thanks, pal. So yeah, I think the, the two of us here are both saying Alvin Kamara versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers feels like a very solid RB2 for the week. Dave, do we get a full sweep? Do we get the stamp of approval here? Yeah, uh, Alvin Kamara is inside my top 15 running backs this week. He's not coming back from an injury. There's no risk that he's going to re-aggravate anything. He was suspended. If you drafted Alvin Kamara, you knew you weren't getting him for the first three weeks, and you knew you were plugging him in week four. Yeah. Now's the time. Put him in your lineup. Don't think twice. Now, before we keep going, I want to ask you guys, if you're enjoying this video, you're enjoying this conversation, seven straight minutes of Najee Harris, and then like two and a half minutes of just Alvin Kamara, please like this video, give it a thumbs up, drop your comments down below asking questions. Who do you need to start here in week four? I know we all need a W, especially those of you that are 0-3. Let's get a win this week, all right? And make sure you're subscribed to the channel. We are bringing you this show on YouTube four days a week, Monday through Thursday, and then Sunday mornings, we give you the live Q&A answering your questions about who to start, who to sit. All right, gentlemen, let's move on here to our next set of running backs. Dave, kick us off here. You are starting Tyler Algier against the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'll pick up the pace a little bit. We don't need to talk about Tyler Algier for seven minutes. Let me just tell you, this man has been a dog this year he, only Brees hall who i you know we kind of did this already he picked up a lot of his yards after contact on a big run but only Brees hall christian mccaffrey and james cook are averaging more yards per after contact per attempt and algier has done that on a pretty significant workload the jags have been kind of stout against the run this year but they have played the texans the chiefs and the Deion jackson led Colts. so i think you need to look at their you know points given up to running backs with a grain of salt because they haven't really faced any good running backs yet. And we know that Arthur Smith, Arthur Smith, sorry, Arthur Smith. Nope, is that's going, his new evil twin Arthur name. Snot. When we don't like him, he's Arthur, oh, was snot or smot? I think I, you know, I like to talk about how Arthur Smith likes to run the snot out of the ball. I think I've Arthur said that about snot. a dozen times. So it just came out Done. Arthur Snot. Done. Arthur this, snot. this is why people need to watch and subscribe because of this fun hilarity and <laughs> this comedy right is here. This quality content right here. Arthur <laughs> Snot is going to run the Smith out of the ball this week. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Way to finish the play, Dave. Way to finish it. You got it. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, Tyler Algier is averaging 15 opportunities per game. I mean, that's crazy. We know Bijan Robinson is the guy here, but Tyler Algier has been a very formidable RB2. So I have him exactly one spot ahead of Najee Harris in my ranking. So I'm actually starting him ahead of him, along with the other guys I mentioned, Isaiah Pacheco, Jerome Ford, Rashad White, Damian Pierce. And some other guys that I'm starting ahead of Roshan Johnson, Khalil Herbert, Jalen Warren, Joshua Kelly. Uh, you know, these are both guys, you know, I'm not, not giving you the super obvious names, but Najee Harris, Tyler Algier, both make for solid RB2 flex plays if you find yourself in a pinch this week. Right, Dave, I've got a the... question to ask you yeah. about Algier. Would you say that the Atlanta backfield is one of these backfields where you could have two fantasy productive backs that you can start every week? And it, what would be another alternative of a backfield that you could start too is Atlanta the only one? I mean, what? Why should we be happy and and excited to enter Algier into our lineup? For that exact reason, I think you could start both of these guys confidently. You know, you were just talking about Alvin Kamara, and I see mm -hmm. this situation in Atlanta very 
similar to what we saw with the Saints for years, where Alvin Kamara was the pass-catching, explosive, get out in space, make tacklers miss, yards after the catch, all that fun stuff. And then you had Mark Ingram was kind of the the between-the-tackles hammer, the goal line back. And because of that, both of them were getting a fair share of high-value touches and a decent opportunity share. And you could start Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram. I see the similarities are there. You know, B. John Robinson is so similar to Alvin Kamara with the explosiveness and the slipperiness and the open field stuff. Tyler Algier, very similar to Mark Ingram in his role. So yeah, I am A-OK starting both these guys every single week. I think I've had both of them inside. I mean, obviously B. John Robinson inside my top 30. You know, he's creeping inside my top five at this point. But uh, Tyler Algier, every single week so far this season has been inside my top 30. Yeah, I think when it comes to Tyler Algier and the Falcons offense, there's just going to be run volume that's there. We know Mm -hmm. it's a team that wants to establish the run. So uh, I think that you can, it might be a little bit more matchup dependent for Algier, but I think that fantasy managers can be a a little confident about starting him in a a flex spot. Now, I I would categorize that as a surprise too, because we weren't really necessarily going into the season thinking that that would be the case. So let's just chalk that up to one of these surprises that we always see in the NFL every year. Hey, Jeff, I just want to say I was very much so beating the drum for Tyler Algier this offseason. I thought that, you know, he was just he was such a good player and I get bogged down by the nerdy metrics all the time. But the rushing yards over expectation last year for Tyler Algier were just insane. And I really saw Bijan Robinson kind of being, you know, it's funny. They they say Cordero Patterson is the joker, but that's what we're seeing with Bijan Robinson lining up in the slot, getting out wide, doing these very creative things. And Tyler Algier is the running back. He's the goal line back. He's the early down guy. That's kind of what I envisioned in this offense. So don't want to pat myself on the back too hard, but I've been a Tyler Algier guy since he came into the league. Big, big fan of his game. You just gave me big fears, Dave, because you mentioned Cordero Patterson potentially coming back and uh, Tyler Snot, man, or what's his name? <laughs> I don't even know his name anymore. Who's the coach? God, we Arthur are Snot. So off the rails <laughs> on this show already. We just hate this guy. I just whatever. I'm done with him. I don't even know his name. I don't care. All right, My Jeff. Goodness. And you said no seven minutes on Algier. And there yeah, we are. here we are. Look at us. Look at us. Jeff, who's right, your next yeah. running back? Let's. Yeah, uh, that's enough. Yeah, Dave, right, you just host. You just host. I'm gonna leave actually. So I have one of the surprises uh, as well this year uh, that I think at least, and that's Javante Williams, and, and how much did Denver has really kind of relied on him and used him in terms of volume standpoint coming off that ACL injury. Just looking at the touches that he's had each week, 19, 15, 15. I mean, that is. I look at that and I'm thinking, well, where are the where was where was this uh, you know expectation beforehand? So we weren't really necessarily thinking that he was going to have this much, but uh, the volume is there for him, and I think that's first and foremost what you want in your running back. And uh, you know he's yet to score a touchdown, but now they play Chicago. They're allowing the second most fantasy points to running backs, and and uh, it, Williams is also doing some some stuff through the air too. He's got four targets uh, per game, so twelve targets. I like Williams this this week as well as going forward. I, I think that uh, he is, uh, you know, kind of coming along. Uh, he's, they're they're kind of easing him in, but I'm really impressed with how much they've been easing him in. And I think the the future can only be brighter for him as he goes along through the season and uh, you know gets more comfortable on his knee. Mentally, he's more uh, confident in his knee, and uh, I think we'll start to see some some action here from Williams, perhaps maybe a touchdown this week. I like that call out. He's the top 24 running back for me. So even the guys that I was touting Najee Harris and, uh, and, and Tyler Algier, I have Javante Williams ahead of both of them. So yeah, I like that call. Yeah. I, I will say this. Javante has looked a little more comfortable every week uh, Jeff. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's one of those, intangible things that we can never you, you can't put a metric on it uh fantasy managers can't look at that in the stat sheet uh, of a player getting more comfortable returning from injury but you're right they're giving him the volume he's getting more comfortable this week looks like it could finally be the smash spot where he gets that ever elusive rushing touchdown all right i'm gonna finish this off. It yeah it happen. could man it very could well uh i'm gonna finish this off here at the running back spot and i might regret this but i'm gonna do it Dave Khalil Herbert going up against the Denver Broncos. All right. I do believe that Herbert is a flex play this week. I will be flexing him in a couple of lineups where I have him. I do understand that he has let you down a couple times. This bears offense has let you down a couple times. 
But similar to what we talked about with Najee Harris, Khalil Herbert actually has not been bad. First, let's look at the matchup he's got here. Going up against the Denver Broncos. Exhibit A, Miami Dolphins. Just ran for 351 rushing yards and five touchdowns. I am not going to compare what the Bears can do to that because we're talking about a historic performance. But then you go the week before. Brian Robinson for the Washington Commanders had a big two-touchdown performance. And what we're seeing here right now is that the Bears are just three-and-a-half-point underdogs, which, by the way, what an awful game to have on primetime. The Bears... <laughs> it's not primetime. That was misinformation that was going around on Twitter. No, it's an 11 a.m. Oh, game. Somebody okay. shared an old clip of their Monday Night Football promo, oh, but it is an 11 a.m. buried in the <laughs> Octobox game, so no worries there. Oh, man, I was I was so worried. But either way, right now, the Bears are just three-and-a-half-point underdogs. And when the Bears are in neutral game scripts, the snap rate tends to favor Khalil Herbert. And I got this from Jacob Gibbs, CBS Sports, that when the Bears are within seven points of their opponent, Khalil Herbert is taking 63% of the snaps, 79% of the rushing work, 66% of the passing work. And I I listen, I I know I probably sound like a broken record here, still advocating for Khalil Herbert. And I I think we we kind of put this little asterisk next to every single player we talk about is that we're not advocating them as a absolute smash play. These are the guys that you're on the fringe of saying, "Eh, can I trust them? Can I start them? This is that moment. The Bears should be in a relatively neutral game script against a bad Denver Broncos defense. And Khalil Herbert just hasn't been bad. He's actually been a top seven running back in terms of rushing success rate. What's been bad overall is that Bears offense. So listen, I might be stepping on the rake here once again, you know, and just getting egg all over my face and thinking that the Bears offense can do anything and move this football. But if there is a week where we think that Khalil Herbert can come out and actually have some of those breakaway runs, he can actually get a touchdown. He can actually continue to be involved in the receiving game. It's this week going up against Denver. Now, go ahead, Dave. Let's hear it. Let's hear why Roshan Johnson is actually the start. I mean, I I do prefer Roshan Johnson. I like both of these guys. I'm not saying that they are as good as the Miami Dolphins offense or as good as Devon Achan and Raheem Moser, but fire up both of these running backs after what we saw, you know, the Broncos, their inability to stop the run and tackle anybody last week. And this just jumped out to me again. Take PFF grades with a grain of salt. I joke all the time that I only talk about them when they corroborate my priors, but The two highest graded players, according to PFF right now, on the Bears, a team that has been void of any sort of offensive talent, the two highest graded players are Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson. So they are the two bright spots in an otherwise pretty bad offense. So, you know, it sounds crazy, but this game has the fourth highest over-under on the week, two very bad defenses, and the strength in the Bears has been in their running back room. So I'm okay starting Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson if you're in a pinch this week. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned Pro Football Focus there, and you, whatever, however you feel about their grades and stuff like that. Right now, Cleo Herbert is ranked as the number ten in terms of rushing grade on the season. So, and the weird I, thing is, you know, the 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 poor grade that you see because they break it down: rushing, mm-hmm. passing, receiving, pass blocking. Roshan Johnson's pass blocking grade has been terrible, and he was graded out of college as one of the best pass blockers coming into the league, has really struggled to get up to speed so far at the NFL, and I think that's the one thing that's kind of holding him back from seeing a bigger workload. But yeah, for now, it is very much so a 1A, 1B situation. I don't even know who the A or the B is. I mean, they are splitting touches uh, quite a bit down the middle. So yeah, I'd, I'd fire up both of these guys this week. All right, before we move on to the wide receivers that we're looking to start in week four, I want to remind you guys that we have this show in an audio version, so you can listen to this while you're on the go. You can find it anywhere you get your podcasts on Apple, Spotify, any other app. And what we do is every Friday, we have an audio-only episode where we give you the weekly matchup previews. We go through all the biggest news, the guys that we're starting, sitting, you know, maybe the things that you haven't heard about in each of these games. And right now, what we're asking from you is if you are a subscriber to the audio show, is leave a review. Go ahead and leave a review, your honest review. Take a screenshot of that. Send that over to klugi at footballguys.com. That's K-L-U-G-E, like my co-host here at footballguys.com. And then Dave will answer any one of your fantasy football questions. So if you have a week four question, you need help with your lineup, Dave's got you covered. All right, gents, let's move on to the wide receiver starts of the week. Dave, I'm going to let you start us off here. You've got Tutu Atwell at the Indianapolis Colts. 
I don't think Tutu's a mirage. I think a lot of people are looking at the production right now and still are uncertain about plugging him into their lineup. He's my wide receiver 25 on the week, and I want to move him higher. It's just, you look at some of the other names that are there, you know, it's weird trying to move him ahead of Zay Flowers and Michael Pittman and Jacoby Myers, but he fits in that same tier as a very live wide receiver too. This blew my mind. I was looking at players who have pulled eight plus targets in every single game through week three. And I talked about this on a show a few days ago, but I'll repeat it for the audible listeners here. You see the obvious names, Keenan Allen, Justin Jefferson, Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, Michael Pittman, Jamar Chase, Chris Olave, T Higgins, TJ Hawkinson, Mike Evans, Mike Thomas, and then boom, Tutu Atwell has seen eight plus targets in every single game game this week just absolutely unbelievable he's the wide receiver 14 right now in PPR and that was with a big touchdown being called back last week um 15th in receiving yards ahead of guys like Amari Cooper and AJ Brown and DK Metcalf and Michael Pittman it's crazy what he's doing and I know like right now um you know uh, Puku Nakua, or Puka Nakua is the bell of the ball everybody's in love with him but we shouldn't ignore ignore what Tutu Atwell is doing I don't know what this situation is going to look like when Cooper Cup returns, but for the time being, you just have to keep plugging him into your lineup. It looks like Cooper Cup could return in week five, and then we'll kind of see who the odd man out is going to be at that point. But for the next two weeks, keep playing Tutu Atwell. This week, I had to have him ahead of Gabe Davis, Terry McLaurin, Tank Dell, Jerry Judy, Adam Thielen, Nico Collins, Garrett Wilson, some pretty big names that I'm comfortable starting Tutu Atwell ahead of. Yeah, this yeah is, and there's this there's is... something to say about like some of these smaller ish receivers, right? I mean, yep. everyone it, it seems like the NFL is starting to take notice. Well, they have been in, over the last couple of years, but these guys, you know, even if they're 170, 180 pounds, can still put up some points because they have speed and offenses are trying to get them the ball in space, and that's what we're seeing. And that's a, a prime example of what what Tutu Atwell has shown us so far. It's not your grandpa's NFL. You know, a guy like Tutu Atwell wouldn't make it three games into his rookie season. But now, you know, player safety is a great thing. Don't get me wrong. Like, I I love that we are taking safety of the players as a priority now. But with the inability to, you know, hit receivers that aren't looking and the blindside hits and, you know, giving receivers space across the middle of the field, it helps these guys like Tutu Atwell and Zay Flowers and, you know, a lot of Devonta Smith, you know, be very good NFL wide receivers. And Tutu Atwell just... I mean, he really embodies that, one of the smallest of the bunch, but he, he's looked great these uh, these last few weeks. Yeah, Dave, I think I'm with you there, at least for now. 2-2 is not a mirage. I'm going to be curious to see how the Rams change things up once Cooper Cup is back. But while, he's, while, while it's the 2-2 show, I mean, ride the wave. Like, let's just do that, guys. These Rams players, don't ask questions. Just ride the wave until, you know, <laughs> that wave crashes. <laughs> All right, Jeff, let's get to your first wide receiver start of the week. You're talking about DeAndre Hopkins going up against these Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, so Hopkins has been dealing with a sprained ankle for the last couple weeks, and we know that Hopkins in the past has played through injury, and I think we've seen him do that in these last couple games. So, I mean, he looks good in practice this week. I saw some uh, some clips of him, you know, just kind of going through the motions and uh, he's got very, very fast, quick steps. And I'm thinking, oh, well, shoot, that ankle looks fine to me. So I think we're going to see him start to improve more and more going forward. And I also want to say that Tennessee, uh, they have we have long thought of them as a, a rushing team, uh, Derrick Henry, first and foremost. Uh, as far as their receiver, though, uh, uh, you've got Hopkins, who's seeing a 30% team target share. So he is their receiving game, so to speak. And now that he's getting healthier, I think this is a, an opportunity for him to kind of show his stuff. And, and this is what he wanted in free agency. He wanted to go to a team where he could be the man, the guy, not go to Buffalo and be with Stefan Diggs, right? Uh, or other teams as well. Uh, he wants to be the guy. And I think that Tennessee is going to give him that opportunity. And if you look at the teams that he's played so far, he played Cleveland, he played the Saints. Those are two good defenses and, uh, you know, he's starting, I mean, he's seeing the volume. He's just not quite getting there in terms of uh, production. But I think we're going to start to see that come forward here this week, especially as he gets better dealing with his ankle injury. So I like Hopkins as someone who is going to take another step forward here and uh, kind of show us exactly why he was the, uh, uh, the big free agent signing here for, for Tennessee in the offseason. 
Yeah, and these Tennessee Titans not looking the same as they have in the past where, you know, maybe they were relying on Derrick Henry a bit more. They're probably going to have to change things up a bit here if they're trying to actually win some games and Ryan Tannehill wants to keep his job. So I do I do like that one. I'm going to give you my first wide receiver start of the week, and it is Christian Kirk, who I think could be a wide receiver too this week going up against the Atlanta Falcons. And there's one really just simple reason here. Zay Jones is out once again. So you're going to have that built-in insulation of volume in what should be a good Jaguars passing attack. Dave, we talked about this on a previous episode. If you haven't listened to that, go and check out our buy low trade targets episode where we talked about Calvin Ridley as a trade target because we fully expect this Jaguars passing attack to improve and to regress back to the mean. We talked about how the Jaguars have been, have led the, uh, the excuse me, have left more receiving touchdowns than any other team out there on the field. And the Jaguars receivers have led the league and dropped passes. Stuff like that, as it starts to float around, it doesn't go unnoticed. If the fantasy football guys are seeing it, I'm pretty sure the Jacksonville Jaguars are talking about that in meetings. I'm pretty sure wide receivers coaches are making that a big point of emphasis in meetings all throughout the week. This is something that is likely to get rectified this week, going up against the Atlanta Falcons, who, listen, they haven't been bad, but they've been beatable. They have allowed four wide receivers to catch touchdown passes this season. There is that whole revenge game narrative where you got Calvin Ridley going up against his former team. They're in London. Those always have some fun surprises that happen out there in London. But really, one of the things, if I want to get a little nerdy for a second, the Atlanta Falcons have allowed the seventh most fantasy points to slot wide receivers. And that's typically where you see Christian Kirk line up. Now, I know with Zay Jones being out, you might see a little bit of Christian Kirk on the outside, but you also might start to see some fun things where Evan Ingram might line up in the slot. Evan Ingram might line up on the outside. Christian Kirk there in the slot. No matter how you slice it, this Jaguars passing attack in the offense should look pretty good going up against the Atlanta Falcons, and that's why I'm comfortable starting Christian Kirk this week as a wide receiver too. I appreciate all of the knowledge that you just dropped on us, Alfredo, but let me just sum it up. If Zay Jones isn't playing, Christian Kirk is a must-start as simple as that that would have been so much easier to say it would have taken so much less time why didn't i just do that that would have been so much more helpful all right well now you get uh, to uh you get to appeal to it with people who like stats and, and people who, who want their answer fast so yeah it, ju- it just just gives me a moment to sound smart and then dave just gets to sound even smarter because he was way more efficient with his analysis there <laughs> uh, at, at this time i want to remind you guys over at footballguys.com We have fantastic weekly rankings that are going to present you guys with upside and downside and custom rankings that can fit to your league based on the scoring, based on the league size, based on your roster. And it's going to have rankings from people like myself and Dave and various other analysts. And to get that, all you need to do is become a Football Guys Pro subscriber. It is the most affordable subscription in all of fantasy football. And to do that, all you have to do is click the link down below in the description to become a Football Guys Pro subscriber and get our custy, custom weekly rankings here. All right, Dave, Jeff, let's move on to our second wide receiver stars of the week. Dave, I love this one. I love it. Joshua Palmer going up against the Las Vegas Raiders. Yeah, I'll keep this one short and sweet. I mean, you knew why you splashed fab on Josh Palmer. Uh, Last year when Mike Williams and Keenan Allen were battling through injuries, he was pulling 9.7 targets per game. No Mike Williams for the rest of the season. And to be honest, I don't know who the better long-term play is. It might be Quentin Johnston. You know, we see rookies kind of ramp up slowly sometimes and then dominate in the back half of the season. But based on what we've seen from Quentin Johnston so far, he is not going to step in as the team's wide receiver two in week three. He is going to be the wide receiver two this week, Joshua Palmer, that is. And this is just an offense that I want as much uh, you know, to be a part of as possible. Justin Herbert's third in the league in passing yards. Palmer's going to be the wide receiver too here. I've got him ahead of some names that you might not be thinking of, but, uh, you know, I'd rather start him over Elijah Moore, Drake London, Chris Godwin, Jordan Addison, Tank Dell, you know, some of the guys that are flashing right now. And Josh Palmer hasn't done it so far, but his opportunity's there now. I was kind of surprised by how much fab people were dropping on Josh Palmer. I put, you know, 15 to 18% on Palmer in just about every one of my leagues, thinking I'd walk away with at least one share of Josh Palmer, but he was going for 40, 50, 60, 70% in some of my leagues. So if you dropped all of that fab on Josh Palmer and you're not starting him this week, why did you do it at all? Put him in your lineup. 
Dave, an interesting uh, bit of information that I want to give you here is back in 2022, Josh Palmer without Mike Williams, 21% target share per game, nine targets per game and averaged 12 and a half PPR points per game. I know this is a different offense because Quentin Johnston is a part of it, but it's also a better offense because right. Kellen Moore is the offensive coordinator and Justin Herbert looks very different. So I am with you 100%. If you went out and you got Josh Palmer in your roster, you have to be starting him this week. Yeah. And, and I've heard a lot of people kind of discredit his outing last week saying uh, it was a really fluky touchdown that bounced off of a defender. Well, one, it still counts. He scored a touchdown and got six points. But two, he was also, you had, had that toe drag touchdown that was a so close to being a touchdown. So, I mean, the opportunities are going to be there. He's going to see a ton of targets. It's a very good offense. Just start Josh Palmer. That's all I got to say. Josh Palmer, one of my favorite wide receiver handcuffs in the league. It just feels like <laughs> every real. time he gets that opportunity, uh, we get a solid performance out of him. Jeff, let's go to your second wide receiver start of the week here. And I got to say, I love everybody's wide receiver start of the week here because I'm a big fan of this rookie wide receiver tank Dell of the Houston Texans going up against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, so Tank Dell was someone that I kind of became enamored with in the preseason. He had some moments of, of brilliance and showed some flash. And I thought, oh, you know what? If he can turn that into, if he can develop that into, um, you know, some uh, some greater opportunities and more volume on offense, he's got a chance because he has those intangibles too. He reminds me of Amon Ross St. Brown. Not only where he was drafted, but also the the process of where he's kind of going, starting from a rookie to, oh, wow, look at this guy. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Look what this guy's doing. <laughs> um, he is he has that dedicated mindset where he's always trying to get better, just like Amon Ra. Uh, talent alone isn't good enough for him. He has to have and find that extra edge to be great. And Dell is on the way to doing just that. He is third in targets right now on the team. Uh, but week one, he was not used as much. And at week two uh, and three, he has led the team in targets and receptions. And he has a touchdown in each of the last two games. So um, he is starting to come alive. The coaching staff uh, is realizing what a talent they have in him. Uh, for those of you that have him in your lineup, whether you drafted him or whether you picked him up on waivers, I am here to tell you that uh, your thoughts about Dell being good are backed up. I love Tank Dell. Uh, I think he's a great value find if you were able to do so. Uh, CJ Stroud has shown that he can be a producer here so far early in his career. Uh, and it all kind of points back to Dell being someone that you can insert into your lineup every week until he shows this differently. I don't think he's going to, because like I said, he's got that extra edge, that it factor that we always talk about. So in my opinion, Tank Dell is someone that could be a league winner simply because you didn't necessarily expect it. And here he comes in and he's maybe he's occupying a flex spot that was a hole. So um, take advantage of that. So yeah, I'm, I'm big. I'm big on tank Dell. I'll just throw in Nico Collins too. I just, who would have yep. thought that we'd be going into week four saying, I want to buy into this Houston Texans pass offense, but <laughs> right. CJ Stroud has looked phenomenal. The team's throwing the ball a lot. If he can keep throwing for 300 yards, Per game, he's going to be able to support multiple fantasy assets. And right now, it seems like it's Tank Dell and Nico Collins are the two guys you want to have. All right, I'm going to finish this off here with our sixth wide receiver start of the week here in week four. And guys, I think I'm finally, I'm ready to sip the Kool-Aid here. Jacoby Myers and the oh, Las yeah. Vegas Raiders going up against the Los Angeles Chargers. And so, I mean, already with that matchup, we know it's going to be a faster paced game. There's going to be a lot of passing. Uh, Jacoby Myers has been pretty darn good when he's played this year. Wide receiver three in week one and then wide receiver 25 in week three after he suffered a concussion in week two. Uh, he's a guy that you've been able to plug in as a wide receiver two or better every single game. And you go back and you start to look at some of the stats, at least 10 targets in both of those matchups and 82 yards in both of those games. The Chargers are giving up the second most fantasy points to wide receivers in the NFL right now. And I wanted to say that this was going to be a little bit more contingent on whether or not Jimmy Garoppolo plays because Jimmy's been okay. He's been solid. He's been able to support these wide receivers from a fantasy standpoint, but the Raiders offense is just so condensed to three players. 89% of the team's offensive opportunities are split between Devonte Adams, Josh Jacobs, and Jacoby Myers. 
no one else in this team really gets involved. And I don't know how much that's going to change. Even if a backup quarterback is in there, you get preseason hero Aiden O'Connell out there slinging the ball around. Fairly certain it's going to remain pretty tight with these three players. Or, you know, worst case scenario, you have Brian Hoyer out there and you have no choice but to start Jacoby Myers because you don't have a better alternative. Honestly, it doesn't look all that bad because the usage tree the, or the usage funnel, excuse me, with this team is just so narrow. It's just these three players. So I really like Jacoby Myers this week going up against the Los Angeles Chargers. Real quick, funny stat here on the Raiders. Even I like funny Jacoby stats. Jacoby Myers missing a game. No wide receiver in Las Vegas has pulled more than three targets this year. I mean, it's just, it's insane. Like when Jacoby Myers wow. didn't play, they just force fed the ball to Devonte Adams. And when they are on the field, it is just the two of them in the passing game and nobody else getting involved right now. Jacoby Myers has almost a 32% target share ninth highest in the league. So yeah, I mean, looking at my rankings right now, I have Jacoby Myers inside my top 20 this week, and it still feels too low. Like I'm debating him putting ahead of Mike Evans and Tyler Lockett just because of the opportunity that he's going to get. Now, you know what? We need to rack that clip because that is huge. We all love funnel teams because mm -hmm. we know that who they're going to go to. And it's, uh, you know, it's something that you can rely on because we're looking for consistency. We're looking for clarity week to week. And it looks like, you know, uh, Myers and the Raiders, J Jacobs and Adams. Shoot. I, I mean, if that's all they're going to go to yep. and if it's working, then that's really good for, uh, um, you know, as far as creating your projections for the week and such. Absolutely. Yeah. Jacoby well, Myers Hunter becoming, Henry. remember Hunter Hen or Hunter Renfro. Oh. Remember when he was, uh, oh. he, was a thing? he was a wide receiver one just two years ago. I haven't heard that name in a long time. <laughs> it's completely irrelevant to fantasy football. I'm, I miss Hunter while. Renfro, man. I, yeah, he, he, could, everyone he does. could be someone on another team and it's wasting away. Mm -hmm. Still just Don't 27. There's still hope. There's still hope. <laughs> some maybe someday maybe someday uh well listen guys we did it we got through our running backs and wide receivers here but we're gonna get to some of these uh a little bit more stinky positions because i think that everyone in fantasy no matter how many leagues you're in one league two leagues whatever we kind of all at this point need streamers at the quarterback and tight end position. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you our quarterback and tight end starts of the week over on the audio version of this show. Okay. So if you want to get those, and by the way, these are all guys that you can probably find on, on your waiver wire. It's not saying, Oh, they're not on my team. So it doesn't matter. These guys you can probably find on the waiver wire. So head on over to the audio version of this show. You can find the link in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching here on YouTube. We'll be back again on Sunday with our live Sunday morning start sits. We'll see you next time. Adios.